Good evening, everyone. That was Hairbone Earth to Mama. That was Raul de Nieves with Jesse Steed and Nathan Whipple. Uh, that was uh, released by Blank Forms Editions. And I want to say good evening to everyone. Welcome. My name is Kevin Arrow. I am the exhibitions and project manager here at MOCA North Miami. Thank you so much for joining us for MOCA's Miami Art Week edition of Conversations at MOCA with artist Raul De Nieves and curator Risa Puleo. Conversations at MOCA is presented by the Green Family Foundation and today's program is generously supported by Company Gallery in New York City. Uh, MOCA North Miami exhibitions and programs are made possible with the generous support of the North Miami Mayor and Council and the City of North Miami and the Miami-Dade Department of Cultural Affairs. Uh, before we begin, we also want to thank our Board of Trustees, our corporate and foundation partners, and our members. Uh, we want to extend a heartfelt thanks to all of you for your meaningful support. Uh, a little bit about Raul. Raul de Nieves is a multimedia artist, a performer, and a musician whose wide-ranging practice investigates notions of beauty and transformation. De Nieves's visual symbolism draws on both Catholic and Mexican vernacular motifs to create his own unique mythology, which often challenges and explores themes of sexuality, the human body, and individual and public histories. Uh, Risa Puleo is an independent curator and critic, and her exhibition, Monarchs, Brown and Native Contemporary Artists in the Path of the Butterfly, was curated for the Bemis Center for Contemporary Art during her year as their curator in residence, and the exhibition traveled to the Museum of Contemporary Art in uh, North Miami in 2018. Uh, she's written for Art in America, Art Papers, Art 21, Asia Art Pacific, Hyperallergic, Modern Painters, and many other publications. Uh, before we begin, I just want to state that in the midst of this tumultuous year, both Raul and Risa prevailed in formulating and delivering an amazing exhibit. They both displayed a tremendous amount of grace under pressure, and they were very patient uh, during the numerous slowdowns, setbacks, and full stops due to COVID-19 during the final stages and planning and the remote installation process. It was a very unique situation that we were in and uh, they prevailed. So right now with no further ado, live from Chicago, I'm happy to welcome Risa Paleo and direct from his Brooklyn studio, please welcome Raul De Nieves to our event. Hi guys. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you both. Thank you for joining us. We're in three different cities. We are. And I am going to uh, turn my camera off and hand it over to the both of you and I'll be back at the end. Carol. Hi, how are you? I'm good. That was so nice to hear from Kevin that we were I so know, thank grateful. you so much for that beautiful introduction. Um, this is really exciting. Um, it's think... really interesting to be doing these talks online right now. Um, I really do miss seeing everyone's smiles or the awkward silences that maybe you would have in front of people or I don't know, but now and we got to do it online. <laughs> and I think that we need some to give some thanks too to Kevin, who was so instrumental in making the show happen, to Alex, to Tiny for making this program and for all the work they did on the show. And, Chana for her Anna. amazing vision for the museum. Um, Taylor and Sophie Taylor. at Company Gallery. And of course with you, we've been talking now for over a year. Wow, it's been, it's been a wild journey as it continues to be, but I know it's, it's really cool to um, just continue to have these conversations with you and to um, learn how to uh, be able to you know, speak more about my work and also have your guidance to understand different um, wild ways of, of, of seeing the things that I'm making and realizing. Um, should we start by like talking about how we like, well, you know, when we first met, like we were like, it wasn't even, 
pandemic time and we were figuring out how two people could like communicate really like closely um, because we both live in different cities. Because it's always um, been long distance for us. Yeah. <laughs> and you were really kind of cool about like asking me to talk once a week and like, and that was a little bit like, whoa, like I don't even do that with some, like, you know, some people, <laughs> but we like really went into it and it was like, I feel like I learned so much about not just my work, but by myself and listening to me, like kind of express myself sometimes very like abstract and how like, even through that, we would like find such a, you know, beautiful way to communicate and to open up these discussions that are what this show really kind of is about. So to let the audience in a little bit on the process, Raul and I would talk on the phone, not even video, sometimes just on the phone, which I think, I mean, we're, you and I are pretty much the same age. We're in our late thirties. Mm -hmm. I grew up talking alone on the phone a lot. I'm very good at talking on the phone, being the sort of like girl in the nineties. Um, and I think that there's a kind of intimacy that you can have this way when you're like in somebody's ear. Um, and that is how we started making this show by just kind of being in each other's ear, getting to know each other, diving into the work, and then getting into like via the ear into the heart of everything that you're making. And one of my favorite moments of our conversations was when we were trying to figure out what to name this show. Yeah. And I think that like, I think that this is one of the best named shows ever. I think so too. I mean, it was so, we were like, you know, because of the work that's in the show, we were like, well, how do we bring these words together? And, you know, I always think about the circle or this idea of like a circle and how there's so many entrance points to a circle. There's not one way that you can access this kind of like central aspect of, of life itself, you know, like, um, for me, it's always been this idea of like, that there's not just one door, there's multiple doors or windows that you can open to like, really just like, get to know yourself. And when we brought up the idea of like an eternal return, it just was like, it, at first we were like, oh my God, it's like, so like epic. And then we, we like, you know, you brought up the idea of like obsidian, you remember? And then when you were like talking about obsidian, I was like, wait a minute, like I wear an obsidian heart around my neck. And it just like started this other conversation about how we like reflect upon ourselves. Because one of the things that I've learned so much about being an artist or creating work is that my work really is um, this like ultimate mirror of myself, you know, like it allows me to express myself to experience like failures or or heartaches it's very emotional and it's like never necessarily like the image that I'm actually supposed to see that there's always something like new to figure out from this like reflection of oneself and then I I brought up the idea of the obsidian because there's so much about ancestors living mm -hmm. in past that you're always in communication with um, different members of your family yes. um, that you're speaking with. And we're going to talk about that when we talk specifically about Basilio when we actually enter the gallery proper. Yeah. Um, but the, what I was talking about Obsidian, we were talking about Mexico, which yeah. is where you were born. Mm -hmm. And I was telling you a story about the Mexica, more popularly known as the Aztecs, and how they used to make mirrors out of obsidian. Mm -hmm. And not only mirrors, but these mirrors were portals to yeah. speak with ancestors. So the fact that you wore an obsidian heart around your neck was um, this kind of perfect metaphor. And then I remember we spoke a long time about the story of this one particular obsidian mirror who, who, that's interesting that I said it with a who, um, went with Cortez back to Spain on the first trips back from the Americas to Spain. And then it went to King Charles 
And then King Charles gave it as a gift to Queen Mary when they got married. And she gave it to her court astronomer mm-hmm. who um, spent like all of his life trying to make, like figure out how to talk to ancestors through it. So this like amazing story that even in this early days of colonization, they believed in the technology of ancient Mexico or what was now our Mexican past. Um, and that that was still an idea that was very much alive in your work. Yeah, I mean, I I really do feel so connected to these like, um, you know, spiritual forms of, of believing and understanding. I think it has a lot to do with um, growing up knowing that my father had passed away when we were very young and that, you know, his memory was one of the most important things that we had as, as, as children, you know, that I, I feel so close to this person that I barely ever knew, but then through the idea of storytelling that my mom would like tell us sometimes, or, or when my aunts would talk about like my father, it was always so, it felt so close, you know? And I think from, from that moment, it's, it was about kind of like realizing that sometimes the things that are, aren't necessarily in front of you are the things that you can access the most because it's, it's like opening up yourself to the unknown and to really just like feel extremely connected with your surroundings and the people that are around you or these voices. So for sure, you know, like this form of, uh, expressing or just believing has really influenced so much of how I see like uh not just like my reflection but what I feel like is reflected upon me you know I'm going to depart from the plan that we have I want to go back into the space and and just start looking yeah I'm going to take us straight to Fina how do you feel about that I love that that's where we should be right now yeah So I think also what's really interesting and something that we didn't realize until we got into the space, what was it, August, and we were installing wearing our masks. Yes. um, That we have these two parts of the title, Eternal Return and the Obsidian Heart. And the installation Fina really became the Obsidian Heart part of the title. Yes. Let me see, I have a really good shot. Um, This one. I love this shot. Like, it's just like so magical. What's, I'm gonna back up, hold on. We're gonna land here, but I feel like we need to talk about what it means for Basilio to be reflected in Fina. So what we're looking at here is a very long, at least 80 foot mural. Yeah. For those of you who are familiar with Raul's work, you may have seen his installation at the Whitney. This is actually an installation that was most recently at Company Gallery in September of last year. And there it was on the ceiling. And here we've put it standing up like it was at the Whitney. Um, The Basilio is named for your grandfather. Mm -hmm. And it's this kind of multiverse, cosmic, many stories colliding, turning around each other. Um, And then you get like these different representations of time. You have the Osoboros, which is like the snake eating itself. So like eternal time. This is a metaphor that comes up a lot in the work and why we thought about eternal return. But then we also have planetary time with here. I don't know if y'all can see my, my cursor um the the sun and the planets going around in these kind of bigger spaces in the center and then um there's kind of like narrative time at the bottom um coming together all at once in an installation that's named for your grandfather can you talk about that a little bit more yes of course i mean um my grandfather was also just such a hero of mine uh, I think because he obviously, um, you know, 
was such a courageous person also. And I feel like my grandfather really understood who I was as a child too. Um, and was always very encouraging of, you know, like being proud of who we were. Um, not necessarily just like Mexican people, but like ourselves and celebrating life. Um, when I started making this mural, um, I wanted to think about like the struggles of life. Um, as you can see at the beginning, at the bottom part of the mural, there's um, all these kind of like scenes happening of, of people either in an interaction or, um, you know, feeling like very strong. Um, in that moment, thinking about Basilio really just opened up another portal of like communicating. And, you know, when I make these works, they kind of are very, uh, I don't have a plan of what I'm actually doing. Um, this mural is actually, I think, 62 individual collages that create one large image. And in, in, in my way of working, it's like I, I have the idea, I understand that what I want to represent is this higher power of understanding, um, you know, time and space. And, and so I feel like it really became almost like, you know, so automatic, like thinking about automatic writing and just like letting things happen. And, you know, when, when I'm doing these collages, it's very like cut and paste. And um, I actually felt so ambitious to create this ceiling for Company Gallery because um, also when I think about like Basilio, it reminds me of my relationship that I have with these people um, that have helped me be, um, allowed me to be creative and company was, you know, such a special person or there's such special people in my life. And when I thought about the space, I wanted to feel like it was, it was being, um, like hugged or that it was this blanket above this gallery that represented the love that I had for my, my family, you know, like thinking that also the gallery becomes this family member of mine and that it's like guiding me to, to feel this ultimate freedom of, of expression. Um, I had told Sophie that I wanted to make this huge mural. And when we finally decided that it was gonna happen, um, I didn't realize how, how much work I actually had put on top of myself, but then it kind of felt okay to just like, be like, oh my God, this is like never gonna end. And then it just like reminded me so much about like, uh, you know, this person also like my grandfather and what he went through in his life. And, you know, he had my mom and my mom is like, you know, my ultimate hero as well. But in a way, like, it's all about having this kind of celebratory aspect of like creating things and, and just letting like, these experiences have different ways that you can view it. The fact that it was a ceiling at, at one moment and now it's like this window or this um, vantage point of like this vision that's, you know, cosmic and of the world today um, is kind of just really beautiful. And then I want to take us here because this installation, which we put in conversation with Basilio is named for your mother. Yes. And this is the sort of obsidian reference in the show because obsidian is and very glass-like. It's a dark black glass shiny material. Um, and that is something that I think that we're putting on after the fact, after the fact that you've made it. Um, and it's called Fina for your mother, Josefina. And it's um, around it, I'll try to get to I'll give us a 360 um, so that we can see everything as we talk about it. We have many different costumes. Mm -hmm. um, here they're on mannequins, but they've been worn mm -hmm. in other occasions by performers. Yes, and then this exhibition or this work I made um, for my show at Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, so it's really beautiful to, to kind of 
see the restaging in a different uh, environment and how um, it was really magical that this experience happened that Fina would be next to Basilio and that they would be reflecting themselves. Um, you know, like I, I never really would have imagined both of these works actually being side by side. So, so like um, in such short time because Fina was 2018 and then Basilio's 2019 and here in 2020, they're like together, you know, this like idea of um, these two worlds coming together. Uh, it really just became so magical. And that was one thing that I remember telling my mom, I was like, in, in the show that I'm gonna have in Miami, your name and, and my grandfather's name are gonna be side by side in these like, in this beautiful space. And it's gonna create this illusion of like, uh, what a fantasy world is. I mean, for me, I love making this idea of Landias, you know, like these lands that kind of, um, I wish I could live in every day, but you know, I'm here in my studio and I feel like it's, it's so beautiful to create these like imaginary worlds that actually do become self-realized. Mm -hmm. And I love this particular moment. If we were all standing here, it would be this reflective and this like kind of brilliant. So what we're looking at is um, Basilio reflected in the dark glass that is um, the ziggurat form con is constructed with. Yes. Um, and it's just this incredible moment that we knew was going to happen. Mm -hmm. But in, at the same time, like, I don't think that we realize, like, kind of the power and the effect of this. Exactly. And this is the moment where that story about the obsidian becoming the portal for accessing, like, ancestors became a reality in the show in a way that we also didn't expect. Exactly. I mean, remember at the beginning, we were, when we were mocking up things on the computer, we had the carousel in the back. Mm -hmm. And then we were like, wait a minute, that doesn't work. <laughs> it was really amazing to just like, I mean, I think that was also like the most interesting thing about like putting the show together. It's that it's these like really uh, large scale artworks that I've been able to create in like just the past four years. I mean, obviously with the help of not just like myself, but a, a lot of people that have helped me and allowed me to realize these beautiful um, artworks that are now in the same room. It's, it's just so, it, it kind of makes me very emotional to really kind of be able to see this happening right now. And it, it just really, at the end of the day, really gives me the hope that I think art really does to people, that there's just so much that can happen if you believe in something, you know, and if you put your love and um, the labor that love gives is just one of the most amazing experiences that I've been able to learn from this idea of art making. And, and you know, to have these totems like Fina and to make these costumes that are all about like the different aspects that I see in my mom, you know, like Fina beauty, Fina wisdom, Fina magic, Fina joy, um, Fina nurture. Uh, and to, to kind of make these ideas or these words really kind of become these um, wearable uh, artworks really just also like blew my mind um, of how in, in such a like, caring and like I don't know I'm like I feel crazy right now because like I wish I was in the space with you guys and that we could like maybe be a little bit closer but here we are and it's it's actually just I don't know it feels really crazy well I can do this and I think that oh oh, oh. Back up. still learning how to drive yeah we're still learning how to drive <laughs> this is our first like zoom like virtual tour talk, so. Um, I wanna go zoom in and talk about beadwork. Yes. Because you're talking about the making of each of these pieces. And I think that there's this remarkable transformation that happens 
when you're making something, Raul. Let's see if I can do this. Kind of. No. Why? Here. Okay, hold on. Maybe go to Dave's of Wonder. Oh, that's a good idea. Yes. Hold on, let me see if I can get close to him. Nope. <laughs> okay, well, we're gonna go to the baby. Okay, let's go. That's to a the great place. Let's go to the baby because this is such an important um, artwork for you. This was like a real transformative moment for you as an artist. You worked on the sculpture for what, seven years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It wasn't a seven year, like, you know, start to finish. It was like seven years of self-realization um, and learning so much about what it meant to kind of uh, want to challenge myself to make sculpture work. Um, I feel like it's one of the most intense art practices, especially when you're making um, work about you know, the things that are among, uh, around you and beads really just like have taken over my life in such a like beautiful kind of way that like I always leave my fucking studio with like beads on my shoes or like there's beads like everywhere. And I go to people's houses and they're like, I found a bead in my bed. And I was like, girl, I wasn't even in your bed. Um, but yeah, Days of Wonder is a work that I started making because I also, um, the title Dave's of Wonder uh, also reflects on my mom's, um, uh, what she does in her work, which she is a caretaker. She has a daycare uh, named Days of Wonder. Um, and I've seen my mom work with children since I was a child. You know, she was a school teacher in Mexico. Um, and when we moved to the United States, um, she opened up a daycare in our home, like the childhood home that I moved into. Um, so it's really beautiful to just like see this relationship my mom has with this unconditional love for like nurturing other people's childs, you know, and like uh, having them from age like six months to four months. And then my mom like will be like, Hannah came and like, she was 18 and, and you know, they still talk about me and I'm like, mom, you're so beautiful. But Dave's a one that really kind of, I wanted to put that energy into this work and to really feel like this, um, this idea, which was the idea of creating something new, which is the idea of um, making life or making something have a life, this sculpture, that represents this almost like childlike, uh, naive uh, dancing, um, disco platform shoes, like celebration, um, and seeing it like kind of have its failure. Like uh, one day it was standing and then like the other day I would come from the studio and it would be like on the floor and I would like get so frustrated. And at one point I like, tore apart the whole entire piece just to find where um, it needed more support. Um, and that was actually really kind of like an interesting way of making work because it was something that was in my life for so long without actually having a self-realized like form that at points it kind of was like, uh, like hard to like talk about it because people would be like what happened to the doll and I'd be like it fell um so I'd have to put it in boxes but um here you see another work that kind of had the same vibe and this one um it's called celebration actually and this was one of my most ambitious artworks that I also tried to kind of realize and through the years actually like um, there's these videos online of me performing with um, Nathan Whipple. We used to be in this before, before Haribo, before Hairbone. Um, I had this band with Nathan Whipple called Try, Cry, Try. And 
in the performance, like we're performing in front of this sculpture and I like took the sculpture apart and broke mirrors in my face and people were like, oh my God, you broke your sculpture and like, at your like performance. And I was like, so what? Um, but this sculpture right here is really just like uh, an accumulation of time too. And, and to see this like thing continue to like live its like uh, experience. And now that it, it, it really has like accumulated all these things um, that I've kind of just like tossed in a box. And I've shown this sculpture so many different times, always scattered on the floor, but I feel like this in this particular um, exhibition, it makes so much sense about this idea of like life and decay and the cycles and, you know, going to a party and seeing the ultimate celebration and then having to clean up afterwards and um, the waste that you could use. Um, a lot of these beads from this sculpture are, they were picked, handpicked from Mardi, Mardi Gras, New Orleans. The first time I went, it was like, I I was astonished by the amount of bead piles that were on the street and they were so dirty, like full of beer and like people's vomit probably. And like, I was like, I don't care. I'm gonna put them in a suitcase. And like, I like checked like a suitcase with like, I don't even know how many beads. I think I had to pay like hundred dollars or something to get this thing back to New York. Um, but yeah, here we are celebrating, right? So I want to come back to this one at the end as a way to kind of conclude our talk. So I'm going to go back to Days of Wonder. Yeah. Maybe we can talk about Mardi Gras a little bit more. That was, oh, no. There we go. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, I miss all that stuff, you know? And I think everyone does like this oversaturated aspect of life. And I think that's in a way like what I think I try to kind of like um, portray in my sculpture work, this like uh, overly worked kind of feeling and to really just like pick at that thing for a long time to realize that it actually could turn into something else. And like, in a way the beat really has taught me that. And it also kind of like makes me think about how important it is to have people around you. You know, like one mind can make a difference, but when you have a huge group of people, it just creates like something bigger. And the beat is almost like that. You know, you can't have one beat because then it just be like one beat, you know? But when you have like so many, it like, it allows me to create this kind of like repetitive motion of like manual labor and to see things slowly grow from one to like a self-realization of like this child. And I think that was kind of what like, I've always seen in my mom, you know, she is 64 now and she's still working at her daycare. And I'm like, mom, like, how are you doing this? Like, it's so, but she loves what she does. You know, she loves this like energy of like these children. And I think it makes her really young. Like when I go out with my mom, people usually like say, who's your sister? You know, and I'm like, no, that's my mother. Um, she's a really cool person. I wanted to go back to New Orleans for a moment and we'll come back to your mom too. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Because I think that there's also something related to the way in which you make artwork that relates to New Orleans too. So when I think about the culture of beads and Mardi Gras in New Orleans, I think about um, this kind of collision of two cultures on one hand, like the sort of French Catholic feasting around uh, the pre-feast before Easter. But then on the other hand, I think about um, the African slave trade and African religions that were present present in New Orleans and specifically like the importance of beads to religions like Santeria yeah. or like Vodun. And in those religions, the beads are carriers of blessing mm -hmm. that there's this way in which like the interaction with the material thing is the material thing kind of becomes this container, right? For the well, all the energy that you're putting yes. in it as you spend seven years 
-hmm. working on the same sculpture and making it over and over and over and again in this attempt to make it stand and thinking about all the costumes that are behind it on Fina or throughout the exhibition. I wanna point out this guy here and the red guy, he's part of a series of babies that also ref, um, recommend reference your mother. Mm -hmm. um, but this idea of like the sort of tactile transmutation of energy that you spend so much time, like literally pouring into your materials as well. And I think that that's something that's really palpable in this show. And part of why it's such a joy to be in front of your work. Oh, thank you. That's so beautiful of you to say that. Um, yeah, you know, I do feel like, I mean, for me, um, I carry rocks around, you know, like not like giant rocks, but like my bag always has some sort of stone that I think has this energy that I put into it. And I feel like when I'm making a work, I really try to put that energy back into these sculptures, which is essentially like my love and care for this practice, you know, and this, this way that I get to have these conversations with people. And, you know, also that it allows me to maybe somewhat not take myself so serious, you know, to work with such a cliche or, or, or I don't know, like you could be like, it could be like this, uh, you know, very craft kind of notion, the bead. Um, but it's like what you say, these, these little like balls can carry a lot of energy and, and they, they do kind of speak that back um, with these works. Let's go back to your mom and let's switch over to this idea of the eternal return. Yes. So this is a concept that comes up in a couple of different ways. And it also relates back to where we started with Basilio and these like kind of movements um, of time and the different ways in which time moves. The planets moving around the sun is a year or the cycle of eternity that we have in the Osoboros figure, um, or also childhood development, which is, as we've been talking about when we talk about your mom, the, the process of growing, maturing, coming into awareness. This is also something that's really important in, let me find it. Where is it? The tarot. Yeah. Um, so if anybody's ever read the tarot or knows how to read tarot um, or gotten their uh, cards read, the card, the whole deck begins with the story of the fool. Mm -hmm. And you, the reader, we are all the fool. Anybody who's getting their cards read is the fool. And depending on which card you pull, that tells you what stage in your journey you're on. Mm -hmm. But everybody starts at zero, which is the number of the fool. And the image of the tarot card at the beginning is um, a man about to walk off a cliff, totally blind, totally doesn't know. And then he has a dog who's like following him off the cliff. So there's also this other kind of time that's in your work um, that's about growth, mm -hmm. the coming into awareness, the fool's journey, which is this other way to talk about the tarot. Um, and we see this throughout the work. So here is a series of paintings called the Four Seasons. Seasons are another way of like marking time. Mm -hmm. Or here's the baby. Here's one of the babies. So they're scattered all over the exhibition. Um, this is all a big preamble to the ultimate ultimate time marker in the show, which is the carousel. The carousel, yes. So literalizing again, if Fina is the eternal return, here we, I'm sorry, if Fina is obsidian heart, here is the eternal return. Yes. And what we can't share in this video is that this carousel works mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And there's an amazing soundtrack that you and the band made. Yes. And then as it moves, these shadows dance all around the okay. walls and they have their own choreography that move and dance too. So you walk into this sort of experience that we are just having a sort of static picture of right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I just I mean, want to point out, we have an Osoboros again, chopped up into pieces. See yeah. this guy, here's his tail. And then here's his face. Definitely. I mean, the, the dragon or the snake are such important symbols in my work because I think they do reflect back on this idea of um, the shedding of, of skin, um, the circle, the return. Um, and, you know, the this character in particular here, um, that's the snake cut up into uh, different parts, really just kind of wanted, I wanted that to also kind of bring back the metaphor of this idea of like, defeat you know like defeat and joy like and what that means like or or the dragon being a lesson um that you're trying to uh accomplish and and how sometimes you have to chop up all these ideas in order to create one but um you know th this 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 idea of the merry-go-round um really was also a plain fantasy and when I was actually, um, the reason why this carousel exists is because it was an idea that I proposed to um, a grant that was provided by our production fund um, in collaboration with Bulgari, the jewelry line. And um, I, I submitted this idea of creating this carousel because I, I understood the carousel told this kind of um, idea of a journey, you know, of a child and a parent and the interaction that they have with one another with this very iconic, you know, um, merry-go-round. Um, and it, it just is really, it was really beautiful that like at the end, all these works really made so much sense together and that they all kind of speak about this this beautiful idea of the story, you know? And in your story, something that I think kind of unlocked your work for me is when we were talking about, um, I'm gonna turn around, I'm gonna look at St. George. This practice that you had really, really early on when you're just starting to make work, you would start by making work the same painting over and over and over again. And that painting is of St. George. And you would tell the story in different ways. Here yeah. is this prismatic kaleidoscope, rainbow colored, um, where the city behind the saint is exploded. Um, I'll show the little, here's a tiny little version. Let's see if I can do this. The yellow painting is actually um, one of the first uh, one of the first kind of um, actual real like I felt like I you know sometimes you're thinking about like what to make work about and this image of the saint really just took over me like. I don't know why I was so like moved by it, but then the more that I kind of thought about and, and reproduced it in these different formats, the more I kind of understood about like this idea of like becoming friends with something that, you know, um, maybe you're scared of. And I think like the realization of wanting to become an artist and being in San Francisco. And, you know, I moved to San Francisco because I, my plan was to go to art school, but I decided not to do it for financial reasons. Um, but you know what, there was still this like drive for me to understand what it was that I needed to kind of um, figure out. And I guess 
that fear of like not knowing what it was is what kind of made me search for these ideas of, of inspiration and to uh, really kind of just become my own uh, vision or to find these uh, other forms of uh, teachers, you know, like the story of St. George really became one of my most important professors, you know, and um, I started thinking about what it meant to be not just um, the angel, but I started to think about what it would be like to be the horse and then what it would like to be the dragon or the city, you know, and to put myself in the perspective of all these characters. And at the end was, um, I think the idea of like overcoming fear, you know, that fear is something that could really put a hold onto a lot of things. And I feel like in, in life, we kind of see fear become like such an important aspect of people's like self-realizations and like the coming of age, you know? And so like this idea of St. George really was that for me, this coming of age and like, to feel that I didn't want to be told what I should be afraid of, that I needed to figure out what those things were um, and what they looked like, you know, and at the end to really become friends with them. So that anytime I wanted to pull out these uh, inner demons to kind of help, help me battle the next demon, there was this idea of like uh, figuring out what that was. And I think that when we think about what you're saying in relationship to St. George, about the stories that we tell, you're investigating the same story from multiple perspectives. And that when we kind of zoom out to culture that a lot of the time we're hearing all the same stories told in new ways. Yes. And putting that together with the tarot work, the work that's related to the tarot cards um, for me came together in this idea of the eternal return, that we're all on the cycle, like a carousel, kind of cycling around the same stories, but every time uh, we're occupying the same story from a different position because we've grown. And then that there's only so many stories that we can occupy, but we're always going to have this new perspective from them. And that's where we came to eternal return because that's kind of the crux of that like philosophical idea. Exactly. And yeah. so I'm gonna zoom us out even further because we were, we were talking about the baby as Daves of Wonder, yeah. as the sort of beginning, beginning of your a, a kind of practice for you moving into sculpture, but then also the baby is this representation of life. Mm -hmm. So to make the baby, you undid a sculpture and that sculpture was celebration. Yes. And so this is kind of like the end of the show, the other half of the baby. So if the baby is birth, here we have death, but it's not death as final, it's death as rebirth. Mm -hmm. It's death as something new. Something and that's new. also why it's not called mourning yeah. or grieving, it's called celebration. Can you exactly. talk about this? Um, well, for sure. I mean, you know, I feel like understanding what it means to kind of, you know, become friends with this idea of things having to end at one point is also the idea of giving yourself the freedom to know that it's going to begin something new. Um, and that each time it's going to give you something to like experience, you know, like the death of my mom, of, of my dad, I feel like became a celebration for all of us and my family, not in a morbid way, but it was like one of the best ways that we could tell stories and, and how it just like opened up all these conversations of like imagining um, and celebration really kind of took on that kind of experience or this word, this, this idea of celebrating and how we can represent it in different uh, aspects of life. Because it's not necessarily just about having fun at a party. It's about figuring out what things need to be celebrated within yourself 
or or how celebration really could be a form of chaos, you know, and to put those things together or to just um, drop your marbles, you know, or whatever, however you want to say it. But um, to have this work kind of really uh, like create not just also a beginning, but an end, because I think when you're walking into the exhibition, you kind of forget that this room is there. And then when you're walking out, you see this glowing, like, a uh, fire red room and then as you walk in there you see that there's this uh like the aftermath of a party or like the aftermath of an idea and that's where celebration really stands and the fact that this sculpture also was at one point um I, I mean I was so crazy when I made this like I made a tape body uh, out of actually Nathan Whipple like I taped his body <laughs> tested it and then was starting to like I just started beating over the tape and then put a pole in there and then like a light. And I was like, wow, like so ambitious. And then I, to see it kind of like have this failure, but like to understand that, you know, and I've carried the sculpture around with me from studio to studio for, I don't know, probably like 10 years. And it's, it's really beautiful to see it kind of always have this, um, introduction into like these these works you know and to to see like how the core could actually be made or or that it, it is this kind of experiment you know um yeah and i don't know i mean in a way like I love this idea of ephemera, you know, like to me, this is a very ephemera situation that it's not necessarily a self-realized idea that it's still kind of um, picking up things from, from studio to studio or that every time I display it, it kind of just continues to grow in a different way. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. This time the red is new. Yeah. And that may or may not come. Exactly. Uh, and yeah. that happened throughout the show. I think that one of the ways you are incredibly generous as an artist is that it became about what is it going to look like in this space, in this moment? And that may not be recreated because guess what? We're not going to be in this space again. I know. I mean, and that's kind of like the crazy thing that, that we can't, physically be there right now but that the work is there and it's like speaking its own ideas and that we're like I don't know it's something really beautiful you know to think about and it's just so beautiful to, to understand that all these works could really just come together and create this this story you know that's that still doesn't it's like the beginning of something new, you know and I think that's the beautiful aspect of this exhibition is that it's this constant movement of um, relationships. Yeah. I can't say it any better. So maybe we should ask the audience if they have. Yeah, let's see. Let's see what they got to say. Yeah. <laughs> I got a question. It says, Risa, you and Raul have such an intimate relationship, but both as a curator artist relationship, just coming out of a big project together and even on a deeper, more emotional level. I think we really know each other at this point. We do. And I think that was the beauty of like, you know, I've learned so much from you and, and this idea of using communication of a way to, you know, open up a new portal to like, the way that we think. And I mean, you really kind of influenced me so much through this time because it it was like just so beautiful to be able to like call you, I forget what day it was, maybe it was Tuesday and that we would end up talking about, maybe not even about art, but it was just these conversations or it was like the moment that I'd be like pacing back and forth in my house and I'd be like, yeah, let's, let's think about like, you know, like this crazy word or whatever. And like, how we would just like, I don't know, be able to kind of like relate in that way. And I mean, even through the making of this show, how 
we went from physical to just not being able to see physically anyone um, and that everything became so like a screen savers kind of conversation, but we were still very close. I felt it made us even closer because um, it just opened up a whole different like way of understanding. Yeah, he says, you mentioned you talked on the phone weekly. Can you talk about your level of emotional investment in curating the show? So I think this thing about the phone, so I live in Chicago, you live in New York, the show's in Miami. We were rarely in the same room for, with each other for most of this. And then we all went into quarantine and nobody ever knew when that was gonna end um, because then the show was gonna open the, in the summer and then et cetera, et cetera. And here we are. And I think that, uh, so first of all, I wanna say that Raul, I wanted you to be in Monarchs, but the timing wasn't right in 2017 when that show was up. And so there's a way in which I think I saw you in the work before I ever met you. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with being of the same generation. We have really similar backgrounds. We come from similar cultures, similar places. But then also that I can like be like, no, this is about the tarot because I read the tarot when I was in college. Um, and then being able to kind of access on a sort of intimate level already with somebody that you don't actually know because you are available through your work for anybody who's there to find you. Wow, so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have another question for this one's for Raul. It says, is there anything about the process of creating work, especially when you have such great big ideas that you would share with young artists? Um, I guess, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's the thing that like, you know, being like, Sophie, I want to create a ceiling for your gallery and her being like, do it, you know? And I'm like, oh my God, now I have to do it. Is that... Um, and I think that's also just like, I've, I've found that it's, it can be really hard to make art, you know, sometimes depending on who you are as a person. But, you know, when I started making these faux stained glass windows, it was because I, you know, essentially I wish I could work with glass, but this is such a easier way to think about like how to execute an idea and to just not put any limits in front of you, you know? And I think that's the thing that like, for me, like there was, there was an actual sense of fear being like, oh my God, how do I go from like making a painting to like making a sculpture without having any money or like, you know, like, and finding these like tools, which were this um, materials really just kind of allowed me to feel that they would show me a form of transformation. You know, that thinking that that tape could actually just look like something else or that, you know, um, reusing these aspects of things that were around so attainable, like just became so like, I think that was like the driving force of the idea that like, I could really think like, okay, I wanna make a carousel. It's like, well, how do I make a carousel? Like, you know, it's, it's using these like things that are already existing. Um, so in a way, I feel like it's it's just about also, um, you know, giving yourself that confidence. Good question. So we have a question I think that's maybe Kevin's going to answer. It says, the show is very interesting. Thank you. It would be, it should be seen in person and it absolutely should. And we've been talking, you and I, all week about how we wish we could be there. I know. How are we handling visits to MoCA? Okay, <laughs> I'm back. Uh, yeah, well, the museum is open to the public. Uh, we have extended hours during Art Week. Uh, you can visit the museum uh, just as you normally would. I mean, we're, we're, um, we're open in a limited capacity, so we're not allowing the museum to fill up with people. We're asking you to wear a mask when you come in. We're following CDC guidelines, but it's, 
pretty much seems like visiting the museum during a normal time. So we encourage everyone to come and see the show just as they would come and see the museum any other time. Just wear your mask. Don't come if you're not feeling well. And the show will be up until March 21st. So we have a lot of time uh, for people to come and see the show. And I give my mom for her birthday. Yeah. March 14. We do have another question I just caught that I'd like to answer for George Fishman, who asks, what's completed in the exhibition and what motifs and themes will you be carrying forward, Raul? Um, I feel like, you know, it's interesting because like, that's the thing. It's like everything is kind of completed, but not really. Like if you gave me something back, I'd probably like keep working on it. Um, but the motifs that I want to, you know, I think there's always a way to think about how to elevate one's practice, um, you know, and then maybe it's, it's, it's interesting because what does that mean? And, um, you know, like right now, me answering the previous question of being like, I try not to put too many like uh, things in front of me that don't allow me to feel like I'm elevating my practice, but um, you know, like continuing to make music with my band is really important to me. And like having this like interaction with, with the public is something that I truly um, find so amazing. You know, that when I get to perform, in front of people and sometimes I, I find myself like really tapping into this cathartic mode of, of how to let go, you know? And I think that's something that right now I'm really missing this interaction that like music really has of people. And um, so I, I definitely, I feel like as soon as they open up like a venue, I'm gonna be like, bam, 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 where can I sweat on? Miles out. Well, I also think I want to. We didn't talk about one thing in the show, and that is performance and music, and how that was actually uh, that's kind of actually a really enormous part of the show. <laughs> got to focus on my mom, <laughs> who is also enormous. She's a performer herself. But this show, I think that like. We w- I wanted to put back into the context of your artwork that you have so many kinds of performance backgrounds, whether that's music or performance art or, you know, drag, and to put those in conversation with the sculptures and the paintings to kind of create this entire world that you um, live in and have made. I mean, it's, I feel like the punk scene or like this musical scenes that I was able to tap into, I mean, really just uh, gave me this beautiful idea of a community, you know, that sometimes I, you know, growing up in San Diego, I was like, oh my God, there's no one around. And then finding, you know, like the punk rock venue and, and being able to go there and express myself and see other people fully let go it just became so beautiful you know and it's I think that was the first kind of like true self that I could feel like the ultimate of myself you know that at at these like venues that were usually run by like people just wanting other people to have this experience really just became so magical and you know these people are still very important to me in my life you know like I, the Secret Project Robot in New York has been one of the most uh, challenging, like most beautiful like aspects of like seeing this DIY culture still continue to exist. And that, you know, at the end of the day, anything you want is possible. And I think that's kind of what music really gave me. We have another question. Do you concern yourself with the durability of materials or take attitude that all things pass? I do take, uh, I I do think that all things pass. Um, You know, I kind of love that idea of like, you know, nothing is completely permanent, but I feel like maybe at the end of the day, you know, 
the idea is what will last longer than like an actual object. Um, but who knows? I also think that there's something very like Mishwakan mm -hmm. about the using what you have and transforming it into incredible, extraordinary ways where it's not recognizable. And then like kind of like an economy of means and extending what you have in the most blown out way possible. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean, that's something that I always, I think that was like one of the most beautiful things about growing up in Mexico is that I would actually see, like you see all these people share something that they have with others. And it really became so like a social practice to like, go and visit the lady who made the best tortillas or you know see the straw workers just like weaving in front of you and and to make needs of of what was around them in order to like transform these experiences we have a comment it's a good one i'm gonna read it it says raul i love your metaphor for the bead that one can only be one but many become something else which maybe ties into your love of live performance, groups of people, or even your love of your mom, again, family and groups of people. This is more of a comment, but um, loving the lineage of the metaphor. Oh, that's really beautiful. Um, Can't wait to see the show tomorrow. Do we have any other, any other questions? Okay. I have a question. I just, I think this is a great opportunity to ask Raul to introduce the figure that's sitting next to him. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually called Stand Inside Your Love. Um, it's a new sculpture that I kind of started this year. Um, it's for a future project that also COVID had a little bit of a, uh, you know, thing that put things, but it's it's been actually really nice to, but, I mean, sometimes that's the most interesting thing is that you're working and that these objects kind of just disappear, you know? And to be able to live with this amazing, like, life-size um, god or spaceman is really cool. And I'm, like, in front of this or behind this, like, tapestry that's also, like, kind of crazy idea of like how I make work which is like these were all like Xerox from drawings that I just kept Xeroxing and cutting up almost like using this idea of like the cut up method and and to create one new image out of things that already existed and to change them and morph them is so it's just really exciting good question Kevin thank you well I think this comes to a nice return <laughs> to, to the end until we can meet again and do this. I want to thank you both for joining us. And uh, before we go, I just want to um, remind everyone that we're doing another Conversations at MOCA on Saturday, um, Conversations at MOCA Life and Spirituality in Haitian Art, selections from the Betty and Isaac Rudman Trust Collection. And that will be uh, with the curator, Francine Bierbrager Rosenzweig, and Miami artists uh, and local treasures, uh, Edouard Duval Carré and Asser Saint Val. So that's on Saturday at noon. And we encourage everyone to visit our website, follow us on social media um, at Mocha Nomi uh, for information about upcoming events. And come and see Raoul's exhibition. It's up until March 21st. And we hope as things cool down, we'll all be able to gather in the gallery at some point. And I'm looking forward to that. So thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Raul. I love everyone. Thank you, Raul. Thank you, Risa. Have fun. Good what night. Do do? Thank you. Peace. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.